Okay, so this okay. so this webinar will be uh, led by Mr. Thomas Matheson, who we will be uh, able to get to know more later on. Okay, so before that, let me quickly introduce to you um, Erudite. Okay, so this is who we are. We are a duly registered corporation in the Philippines that provides physical asset performance management and consulting services to industries of all types, including manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas exploration and refining, and various chemical and process industries. So uh, the last of your um, screen um, is our partners who we've, um, yeah, <laughs> our partners so far. And we're very thankful and proud that we were able to um, connect with them. And these are the people who we've met so far. So if nanjan kayo, so kawai kawai na lang po. Um, very thankful to our clients. Yes. Okay. So, hello po sa ating mga nasa FB Live. Yes. Okay. So, without further ado, um, let's meet our speaker for this afternoon. So, he is Mr. Thomas Matt. Matheson. He has 39 years of experience across two industry sectors and two continents. He has led and, support, and supported significant change management projects in the UK and the Philippines that have driven asset life cycle improvements and reduced, okay, so full life cost. Okay, so without further ado, Everyone, please give a round of applause to Mr. Tom. Okay, are we ready for me to go? Yes. Okay, can you? I'll, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, let me share my screen. Welcome. Magarang hapon sa anyong lahat. I'm afraid that's my, despite living here for 14 years, that's the only Tagalog I can really uh do these days so my apologies it will be in english i am uh northern english or northern british um so i have quite a thick northern accent if i'm going a little fast or i'm a little unclear please raise your hand and i'm sure patty will be able to spot that i can't when i'm in the share screen but patty will be able to spot that and maybe ask me to slow down just a little bit okay um we've only got an hour and I've got quite a lot to get through in an hour, okay? So let me just start off uh, with, um, Patty said I've been in the business for 39 years. Unfortunately, I've just clocked my 40th year. And, um, and, and that's partly because I didn't follow a traditional route. I left school when I was 16 years old and went into an engineering apprenticeship. Okay, but let's get straight to business. We're gonna cover this in two parts. The first part, I'm really going to focus on uh, the asset life cycle and life cycle costing, okay? In the second part, I'm gonna be really looking at the broader subject of asset management and how what we talked about in part one kind of fits into a broader role of asset management because at the root of any asset management is actually understanding your asset life cycles, okay? So we're gonna cover all of these topics. Um, I would normally do these topics and a few more in a two or three day course. So please bear with me. We're going to move over them a little quickly, um, but it, it would be inappropriate to really leave any one of them out. So it's going to be quite light, quite quick, but hopefully quite clear as well. Okay. Let me start off with um, a little bit of background, a little bit of history. Traditionally, um, there is there's a, a lot of asset management and asset management life cycle activity been happening for many, many years. And uh, we've generally been structured as industries in quite siloed approaches where there's departments with specific responsibilities and they may or may not talk well together. More often than not, not. Um, let me just walk through a little bit. We've got the maintenance department. Now, the maintenance department is traditionally where asset management concepts were born in many organizations. 
And they were the ones that had the data. They were the ones that maybe the first to introduce maintenance management systems. They're the ones that actually had records of what has happened in the past. So asset management kind of started around there. In parallel, if I drop down a couple of blocks, if I go down to financial management, but finance people were also managing assets because they bought them and they had to depreciate them. They had to manage that asset over the time that they expected the, it to add value to the organization. They were doing their own approach to asset management, but they weren't necessarily well connected. In the middle, you have operations management. They need to get everything they can out of those assets uh, in terms of performance, quality, reliability, everything. They need these assets to do what they were designed to do. And quite often, these organizations didn't actually have objectives, KPIs, business efficiency metrics, whatever your, your, your company are using. They don't typically have a lot of alignment. The maintenance team is about achieving the maintenance plan, making sure that there's no activity that's not being done. Operations is about maximizing production, um, maybe managing production costs as well. Finance is really looking at trying to manage the overall cost of the organization. And quite often, maintenance is a, a cost, therefore, uh, a one to be squeezed when, when times are tight. So you've got and I've simplified it. We know there are other organizations in there, the sales and marketing and all the other functions within your organization. But the three big ones often didn't have very clearly aligned objectives. Okay. And as a result of that, it meant that there was asset management, but asset management in silos. And it didn't necessarily ever give anybody the full picture. So when we talk a little bit now about the asset management, what are the big five gaps that I've found as I've gone around uh, the various industries I've worked in and the uh, various industries I've worked with? And there have been many. And the five things that regularly come out when we talk about gaps in asset management and, and understanding your assets. The first one is, was the asset purchase with fitness for purpose in mind? Okay. I'm not talking about here, was it the best quality? Did we go out and buy uh, an, a, a BMW as opposed to buying a, a uh, one of the new Chinese models, Cherry? I'm not talking about quality. I'm talking about fitness for purpose. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I worked in an organization, and, and this actually happened to me. I'd, I'd been uh, a new project had happened that fitted a new set of sludge pumps into my facility, and the pumps were not performing as I expected. They were, they were performing well when they worked, but they were breaking down every two to three years catastrophically. Okay. And I was frustrated with the amount of times I was having to spend vast amount of money repairing these assets versus pumps of a similar type from the same manufacturer elsewhere. And what I found out was that the pumps that had been purchased were low capital cost but were only designed for the mining industry because the mining industry was so abrasive, they would wear everything out, in, including the cast iron casings, within about three years. So they only needed something that would last three years because no matter what quality they bought, it wouldn't last beyond three years. And yet we'd bought that and I wanted it to last 15 with minimum interventions in the middle. So it, wasn't, it was a good piece of equipment if I was in the mining industry. It was a poor piece of equipment in the wastewater industry okay so fitness for purpose doesn't mean to say the best it means is it the most fit for what you need it to do are the common goals really understood and integrated into your department goals bms and kpis and again if i go back to that last slide it was really about many organizations they have some linkage across their their um their uh, um goals and uh, goals, targets, and KPIs, but is it really actually all pulling in the same direction? Or is one actually driving a set of behaviors or a set of actions that's contrary to the overall benefit of the asset and indeed the asset's performance? So a lot of time I spend with, with I would spend with an organization, I'd look long and hard at what they're measuring and what they're using to make decisions to make sure they're actually using the right information and it's aligned with the, the broader business objectives. Does the operational plan affect the asset life? And by this, I mean, 
um, is the operator operating in a way that will make sure that the asset performs well and the asset life is achieved? Or are they doing things with that? Are they, for example, it was designed to run uh, 12 hours in every day. And the expectation was we would only ever run for 12 hours in every day, but they're running it for 20. Okay. It might be because they have to, but that should trigger other discussions about what the asset life um, should be amended to. But is the operational plan, how they operated, impacting either through poor operation or inappropriate operation or operation that must be done, um, but needs, therefore, the asset life needs to be revisited? Same with the maintenance plan. Are you doing what you always do, which was you have a calendar and you stick to that calendar because that's what you've always done and it seems to work? Are you looking at, does that plan actually drive the quality that's expected from the asset? Uh, does it drive the production cost that's expected from the asset? Or again, is it in a silo and ensuring the reliability, but not focusing on quality or cost? Okay. Are the expectations of the asset life commonly understood and agreed. All right, what do I mean here? Um, on this particular one, I will argue that there is a, um, a time where sometimes the finance people may be expecting an asset to last, say, 20 years, okay? But no matter what you do to it, you can only get it to five years. And then you have to invest a lot of money to refurbish it or to replace it even, um, for you to, to move forward. Now, that's a mismatch over what's expected from an asset life. You need the organization, the financial people, the operations people, maintenance people, the asset management function, if you have one, to come together and agree a common set of asset lives, asset by asset, if necessary. Okay. If you have asset classes, groups of assets are all do the same thing, they're all the same age, they're all in the same condition, you can maybe look at it from a, a group perspective. But often, as you have different aging assets or assets with different sets of histories and problems, you may need to go down as detailed as each individual asset. Okay. So they, they were the five most common things that come up to me. Okay. And a lot of this is because people are not looking at the asset in a holistic whole life mindset. They're looking at it from when either when they buy it or when they're installing it or when they are um, operating it. Um, and nearly nobody remembers that it's got to be shut down at some point. I'll talk about that in just a little while. Moving forward, just a little bit of history here. It was probably around the turn of the century, and I mean the 21st century, that the, the industry started to understand that there needed to be a platform, a format, a, a, a standard, if you like, for what is good asset management. This was heavily driven by the British regulatory frameworks that run their water utilities, their electricity utilities, and electric, electrical distribution facilities. The government was asked, being asked to approve tariff increases uh, based on or the need to replace lots of assets, but it had no view whether the companies were doing it good or bad. So a lot of pressure came in to try and level the playing field and say, we've got to know what's good, and then we'll pay based on people working towards what's good. So from the British Standards Institute came PAS 55. Now, PAS 55, it was, um, if I remember correctly, there's about 50 different, sorry, 50 companies were involved across, I think it was um, 14 industries and 10 countries. So this wasn't just a British thing. It wasn't just um, uh, a regulatory thing. Um, and it was really picked up by the petrochemical industry and the utility industries because they were heavy asset owners um, and they really saw the value in trying to drive um, a good asset management system that would hopefully drive the right behaviors in looking after the assets. It was a clumsy system. It was a 28-point checklist. Um, I was he here doing this when it first rolled out in, in, in the company I work for in the United Kingdom. And it gave us massive headaches to actually try and comply with the system. But when we got compliant, it wasn't really a good system to tell you whether, yeah, you complied, you got all 28 checks. But were you efficient? Were they effective? That was another question that was left hanging. 
Okay. So it was a good start, but it wasn't a particularly um, usable system. And the good news is it very quickly got replaced um, by ISO 55001. Um, that's right. Yeah, 55001. And that was saying around about 2014, I think. Okay. The asset life cycle. Um, this, this is actually taken from um, Pricewaterhouse Canada, uh, Pricewaterhouse Cooper Canada. Okay. Um, you'll find lots of these. If, if you want, if you want to go and look up asset life cycle, you'll find about 20, 30 versions of this with your first click. Okay. Um, I like this particular one because it, it, it's, it's easier to understand than some of the others. And it really tries to identify the, the, the cycle, if you like. But I will say it is still very much a simplistic model. Where do you start? Where do you finish? Why is it sequential? We all know that asset management activity is not sequential. Um, you're going to need to start the open. Let me just pick one as an example. Operations and maintenance does not start after the asset has been acquired. You should be considering the, op the, the operations and maintenance way back when we're starting to talk about requirements and definitions, asset planning. So it's, it's, it's actually more a blended cycle, but to make it simple to explain to people what's being looked at, this is a favored one. It's the, also the format that takes place in ISO 55001 to a degree. They talk about the cycle in this way. And it's anchored on the plan, do, act, check, or plan, do, check, act, um, which was familiar with the earlier ISO uh, uh, frameworks as well. What I feel it really misses, though, apart from the fact that it makes it a little simplistic by making things look like it's all sequential, when we all know there are actually... Um, if you were to draw this out in a project plan with the interdependencies, it would be quite a horrendous thing and very complicated to look at um, if you were to, to map it out that way. This, this oversimplifies it, but it also misses the, the obvious need for financial planning. Okay. Um, what we're saying here is when we start looking at the, all of these different activities as we go around this this circle, each one of these requires to be funded. And it needs funding for all years that this asset is expected to be active. Let's take a, a typical pump. In many industries, a centrifugal pump, would, uh, and I'm talking a large centrifugal pump, uh, high value, high cost item, it would be expected to get 20 to 25 years out of that. We would expect to spend some money on it within that period. So it's making sure that when you plan your asset life cycle, you're already planning the financial interventions needed to go forward. We actually had, a, 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 again, let me go back to a company I worked for in the past. We had a combined heat and power engine. So we would use burned methane gas that was produced by the process. We'd turn that into electricity uh, and heat. Okay. Um, these engines were both very expensive engines. Given an asset life of 25 years, they were almost major repairs needed by year five to seven on every single one of them. Um, we needed to do cylinder head replacements, cylinder head refurbishments. We needed to put um, uh, replace many of the components because of the corrosive nature of the gas that they were the raw gas that we were using. This had not been budgeted for. It was assumed we'd buy it, and at 25 years we'd replace it. Okay. So when I was trying to ask for capital to extend the asset life, the, the accountant was asking me, so it, it, 25 years, how long will you extend it for? I'm going, no, 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 no. I'm at year five. I'll extend it to year nine if you let me spend this money. Um, so you've got to make sure that the financial planning is in place for your whole cycle. And I will point out, many people forget disposal. If you are in the operations arena, it op, uh, disposal is usually an OPEX cost. Please make sure your financial people are already thinking about uh, any assets that are coming up for disposal if it's not already in your asset management plans. Okay. So we, 
talking a little bit about the life cycle, why is it important to look at an assets uh, in, in a life cycle mindset? Okay, the first one is, it's to protect your investment. The investment is twofold. It's a cost of the original equipment. But remember, that can only be 20% of the total cost that you spend on that asset throughout its life. Okay, that's a good rule of principle. 20% is usually typically what you would spend. There are exceptions, of course, but generally your capital cost is only 20% of what you will spend on that asset over its life. So you want to protect your investment. It's expensive piece of kit. The next thing you want to look at is you need to manage the whole life cost. You want it to do what was expected of it, and you need to be able to fund what you need to do to make sure it does that as you go through. And you need the whole life cost because you might want to compare asset A with asset B to see which gives you the best value over the time frame. Let's say again, for simplicity, 20 years, which will give you the best value over 20 years. It may not be the cheapest asset on the market. Okay, It may not be the most expensive either. So what do I mean by a whole life cost? Okay, so again, if you look at the first bar, that's your initial capital cost. It may include construction. It may include installation. Okay, um, if you're building a brand new greenfield facility, it can be a little bit hard to allocate a percentage of the cost of the overall construction of the facility to one particular asset. Some organizations take it to that level, many do not. They will accept that the original construction of the overall facility was a one-off cost, and uh, but then they will make sure that they actually uh, take that into account when they do the review going forward. So again, if you look at it, one cost, it may be the most expensive cost at the first, uh, at any one time, but when you start to look at the other costs as you go over the years, you can see that by the time you add all of those up, it is significantly higher than your initial cost, especially on a multi-year asset. So we're looking here at typically what are your operating costs? Do you have preventative maintenance? We are arguing that we should be doing some preventative maintenance um, every year. What I'm doing, I've, I've tried to make it a little easier to read by not putting too many pieces of information in. We've got any renewal and rehabilitation, okay? Either the full asset renewal or maybe partial asset renewal. You, you've had to buy uh, a new component for it, a new impeller, a new or whatever it is that you're working with, okay? We've got corrective maintenance coming in. We've got condition monitoring that will be cost as we go through if you're doing condition monitoring. And of course, when you're doing your whole life cost, you should plan for its disposal. If you're in the petrochem industry and you're decommissioning, for example, uh, a silo that is, is contained some form of petrochem uh, um, uh, product, then you may, including in your disposal, even things like land remediation. Okay. Unfortunately, in nearly every organization I've ever worked with, um, when I've entered the organization, disposal has not been something that has been overly considered. It's a nominal 2%, 3% of the asset value for disposal. When in reality, um, that may have been okay 50 years ago when there wasn't the legislation needed for how you dispose of mercury, how do you dispose of CFCs, how you dispose of um, uh, certain materials. Um, it, it, it may have been okay 50 years ago, it just went down the scrapyard. These days, disposal is an expensive business. So make sure that your organization is planning for that if they haven't done so already. Okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of costs go into making, and this is, again is simplified. Okay, I'll talk about that in a little while and, and some of the other things that may be included. So we've done the first two points. To ensure that the asset operates efficiently and reliably. Okay. It's not just reliably. I have talked to many reliability engineers and their focus and their KPIs is all about reliability. You've got to put efficiency in there as well. The asset can be superbly reliable, but if it doesn't produce the quality or it doesn't produce the, the, um, the efficiency that's required, it's not performing correctly. The whole life cost will be effective. Um, to ensure productivity targets are achieved, to ensure your customer service targets are achieved. Many customers these days have very little tolerance for when things go wrong. 
especially if you're in the, the power sector, um, you, your customers are very, very irritated very, very fast when the lights go out or here the aircon goes off. Um, to ensure that finance um, has been planned for each phase of the asset life, to ensure that the risks are understood and managed. I'll talk about risk in a bit more detail in a while. To ensure the asset is refurbished, renewed, or decommissioned at the right time and depreciated correctly. I'm not going to go into depreciation in this particular webinar, but understanding as engineers, if you all are engineers, understanding your organization's depreciation policies and how your finance people are looking to manage the asset, very important. You need to be aligned, like I said earlier. Um, what factors impact? I want to go over this very, very quickly, if you don't mind. Um, we have fitness for purpose. I've talked about that already. Are you buying the right asset and using it for the right purpose? Did you assess the risks and have the risks being calibrated or managed? Are your operators operating correctly? You see, there's a link back to what I talked about earlier. Are your maintainers maintaining correctly? If there's one tip I can say is my background is maintenance. I started off my career at 16 years old as an apprentice maintenance fitter. Four years training to become a craftsman. Two more years to prove myself to become a master craftsman. I then went to maintenance management. I spent a big chunk of my career in maintenance. And the number of times I go in and see over maintenance, it scares me. Yes, the following a plan, and it seems to have worked well for years, but you're over-maintaining it, you, you, you're adding costs that's not necessary, but more importantly, you're running the risk of introducing faults that didn't need it to be introduced. Are you only using genuine materials, spares and consumables? If not, and you've deviated, has that risk been assessed? Is the, the asset life that's set already realistic? Have you established criticality across your assets? Are you focusing your greatest attention on the ones that's got the biggest impact on your organization? Did you plan for downtime and redundancy? Did you ensure that the finance was in place for each stage again? And do you have an asset management plan? Okay. And finally, do you keep accurate performance records, operations, maintenance, productivity, finance, and can they be collated and analyzed easily? I will share with you, in the Philippines, I have not found anybody who has been confident to say yes to everything. They have elements well managed. They have elements where there are significant gaps, usually in history. Um, there's a lot of activity at the moment in the Philippines to, to bring your asset records up to uh, standard. But quite often, they've been paper-based, they've been lost, they've been lost in floods. The, the gaps are there. And it's making sure that those mistakes are not made going forward. Let me talk a little bit about what's in the cost. Going back to the earlier chart. Okay, I'll just put that up there just to give you a view. There's normally five blocks. Your initial capital cost. That's the cost of actually buying the asset from whoever you buy it from. The cost of installing it. The cost of um, maybe research and development, pilot costs, anything that went before you chose to buy that asset. Again, some organizations will allow research and development to be capitalized. Uh, things like uh, feasibility studies, um, they can be capitalized. Other industries do not allow that. Okay, so again, you need to talk to your finance about how your industry is governed, how your company approaches the different blocks. In the um, regulatory, regulated industry where I come from, because the amount of feasibility that had to be done in trying to lay extensive water lines and sewer lines, we were allowed to capitalize that cost because we gained information. That information went on file for many years to come for other people to use as well. So a lot of capital costs can be um, on the cost of the asset, the cost of construction and installation, but do look also as to what did you spend to actually determine which asset you would buy. You then move into the operations cost, okay? Now, excuse me, I need to shut that down. Um, the, um, the operations cost, here we're talking about um, not just the cost of your power, 
the cost of your materials, the cost of um, the maintenance. We'll talk about maintenance in a little while. But you talk on the manpower. But you're talking also in the operating cost. If you're running a, a production line and there is wastage, okay, um, you, every time it breaks down, whatever it was producing becomes poor quality, and therefore you've got to scrap it, that's an operating cost, okay? Every time you have a downtime that where there is no output going, so if, you've got, if you're in the power sector and your turbine shuts down and you're not selling electricity from that turbine, that's a cost of operations. These are all costs of operations that need to be accounted for. Your maintenance cost, you're into here your... Obviously, your um, predictive, your uh, plan preventative, any reactive maintenance, all of these need to be brought in. But it's looking at all of the costs that go with running that organization as well. And you may choose to allocate costs in a percentage basis against activities because you can't break down um, the cost of using this particular tool or that particular vehicle for, 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 for one particular asset. So you may spread that cost on a percentage uh, allocation basis. Renewal and cost of refurbishment. So this is where we start now to look at if you have to then replace the asset or a good portion of that asset, what is the cost of then renewing that components as part of your, your, your uh, or, or refurbishing it as part of the whole life cycle? And do you need to do that on more than one occasion? Go back to the CHP engines I talked about. We, we ended up refurbishing them every five years because if you left it at seven, they failed. So every five years, we refurbished the, the engines going forward, and we, we were able to get that built into the plan. So we were able to correct the mismatch between the financials and the asset management uh, uh, approach. And lastly, don't forget the disposal cost, especially if the disposal cost uh, will include managing hazardous materials um, or expensive to dispose materials. On the positive side, if you can sell the asset and get some income, that should offset some of your costs. OK, that's what makes up a whole life cost. Again, if we were in a, one of our, my, my two or three day workshops, we'd spend a lot of time looking at the actual things that make up each of these blocks. I don't have time in the hour. I do apologize. OK. But in short, and this is I, I like saying this when there's financial people in the room, because um, I've argued with my CFOs over the years on this one. In short, everything wears out. OK, it's about managing the assets. So the inevitable wear and tear of an ever aging asset does not results or safety. OK, so it's really about understanding that it will deteriorate over time. But our actions, our asset management plan will manage it such that it doesn't cause the business uh, undue risk. OK, or cost. Managing an asset life cycle and determining the life cycle cost is a costly business. It requires a lot of effort from multiple functions in your organization. You need to focus on what has been most impact on your business results and use tools to help you when you do this. And I'm going to talk briefly about two, risk-based management and asset criticality. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Okay, uh, risk in terms of asset management can be defined as consequence of failure multiplied by the probability of failure. Now, consequence of failure, it's about the impact, the impact of that failure on the business. This could be financial, legal, contractual, reputational, employee and or public safety. And understanding your risk is a basis for understanding your asset criticality. The probability of failure is the likelihood of failure. So simplistically, I'm going to say risk is about impact and likelihood. Very easy to say, very easy to quantify. Um, and what you may have to do is you may have to use a number of um, quantitative uh, um, metrics, but a lot of qualitative statements as well. Okay, And understanding that and coming to a common view is important. And the reason why likelihood is difficult is you may not have any records to help you determine the likelihood of a failure. If you've only got two or three of a large asset and nothing's ever gone wrong with them, so trying to predict 
the likelihood of a failure is going to be very difficult to you. And what I would say is you need to go to market. You need to talk to the manufacturers. You need to look at the industry studies, if any, for your particular uh, um, uh, industry and how they use the asset and the experience that they've had. There is a wealth of data out there. If you are members of the various societies, if you're a member of the asset management associations, of your management of the mechanical, electrical uh, uh, associations, they have a lot of information. Try and broaden outside, though, of just the Philippines, okay? Because what I find in the Philippines is quite often we may only have two or three in the whole country of a particular asset. So as a result, you need to maybe look at more global societies and memberships of, 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 of organizations that will allow you into a wider field of data, okay? Ultimately, it's about risk treatment, though. Having understood the consequence of failure, and that's usually very quantitative, um, and the probability, which is lots of statements, then you might really get into then understanding what risk treatment will you do? Will you try to reduce the risk by doing some actions? Will you try and avoid the risk um, by going for maybe multiple redundancies? You know, so you've got three, you only need two, let's put three more in, and then I've got, it's never ever going to break down, okay? Maybe a little bit uh, uh, expensive though. Are you going to transfer the risk? Do you really need to do that activity? Or is somebody out there better at it than you are and they can do it for you? Okay. And you'll see that with you, you contract people in to do certain activities in your, your, your premises because they have skills, tools, and equipment that can do it better than you can. And that's about risk transfer. Okay. So let me just talk very briefly about probability of failure. I'm a little bit behind time. Probability failure. The top left chart, we're looking there at the, um, it's, it's in every textbook. If you've ever studied mechanical engineering, uh, statistical engineering, you, you've looked at anything in asset management, you'll see a bathtub curve. I tend to find that many industries, it doesn't really fit when you're talking about managing assets. It's great when you're looking at products and those products are high volume, Lots of them, and you can see how many fail at the beginning, how many, what the length of time is before they start to wear out and fail at the end. It's not a particularly useful one, but some it will fit some assets. Okay. The second one is traditionally used for passive assets, civil assets, but it also kind of fits when you start looking at some very large, robust equipment that runs for 20 to 40 years, like a transformer. You would expect it to follow something like a curve like this where you have a very steady flat line almost for most of its life, and you start to see failures occurring as it starts to either, you haven't uh, changed the oil frequently enough, you haven't degassed the oil, you haven't um, uh, looked at maintained it particularly well, you'll start to see maybe some increasing failures. And when it gets to the end of its life, the copper's getting, the copper's getting thin, the, 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 um, the windings of uh, protection is almost gone, then you start to see the failures coming in. So it fits non-civil assets as well. But in the industries I've worked in, I've never had enough assets to plot the top two curves of the same type. I may have had in uh, the company, I, I, ma I managed uh, an asset base of over a million assets uh, for a company in the United Kingdom, but there was, there was so different and diverse in how we used them all, I never was able to build a chart up like the top two. I tended to use the bottom chart. And in the bottom chart, I'm using proxies. Okay. So I don't have a high number of assets. So what can I use instead? If I've got a number of assets, and if you look at this one on the chart here, I've, I've assumed I've got about 20 assets and I'm plotting them uh, maybe based on, um, it could be the, on this one here, it's the effective life consumed. So they weren't all bought at the same time. So I've got some that are aging faster than others. And I can see where they are against a standard which you would define. You set the minimum standard and you set the, uh, you, you, and, and then you can determine the average based on your minimum and your actual, um, where your performance is. So I'm matching the, the effective life consumed with where it is in terms of its performance, okay? Against a standard. But you could also use age, usage, that one is usage, condition, or you could even use historical data if you have it. And again, um, when I 
the last company I worked for in the United Kingdom, we had solid electronic data records. There were some gaps. They didn't always map across from system to system, but we had solid data from about the, the mid 80s. Um, when I moved to the Philippines 14 years ago, we had nothing. Okay. Even now, it's not as robust as I would like it for that particular organization, but they're moving in great strides now. Okay. Um, you can also put your information into a chart like this. You, you determine what is acceptable to you. You determine what is unacceptable to you. This is using your organization's risk appetite. And you can set a number of parameters. For example, um, cease and desist order and fatality is unacceptable. It's re if it's almost certain and likely, we need to do something about it. OK, so anything in the red block, if you've got an asset that moves into the red block, then it would trigger an immediate action. If it's in yellow, action should already be planned. And you can see that by the time you get down uh, minor injury, uh, the penalty is not too severe for a large corporation um, and it's rare. Then you're into green and you don't really need to do anything if it's in the green area. It's just a way of how you would map an asset or a group of assets. And by group of assets, they must be of a similar age, doing a similar duty in a similar environment uh, and a similar condition. Okay. Right. Um, I'm really behind. Tell I need to move a bit faster. Asset criticality is a relevant risk of high technology, sorry, of high possibility, unacceptable, and cost arising from the failure of the asset. And I tend to group the risks into or the impacts into three areas business social and community and environmental impact okay i'm not going to go through these you will get a copy of the slides i'll just pick a couple out for example safety is a business risk it could cause you to be um, uh, given a cease and desist the complexity the impact on the environment a loss of service these are all business impacts that if these happen it will impact your business either immediately or in the long term um, social and community impact. This is a little bit about looking beyond maybe your borders, taking into account your customers. It might be a loss of trust. They may choose another supplier. Um, there may be litigation if your disruption has impacted their business or their health and safety. It might be community disruption. No power for a big chunk of Metro Manila, for example. Okay. The environment, how are you going to create a pollution risk? Again, health and safety comes into that. Are, you, are your operations going to cause damage to other people's properties? Okay. So you start to look at the risk in terms of where are the impacts. But I will share with you that whilst that's good and there's nothing wrong in doing that, when you start looking at trying to understand criticality, because this is all about trying to determine which of the assets are most critical. If he's trying to understand it, don't just ask the questions about what is the impact, but ask the question, what can I do to make this asset non-critical? Because the objective is you should only have, and again, it's the nice 80-20 rule, only 20% of your assets should be regarded as critical. Any more than that, it's going to be very difficult for you to manage. Um, the mission impact, um, customer impact, safety impact, environmental impact, regulatory impact, I picked them up from the previous slide, if you like. Um, they were all in there in those three blocks. But I'm now starting to bring in questions like, what's the single point of failure? Um, is there a planned maintenance history? And if it's a good history, maybe it's not as high risk as we think it is. What's the corrective maintenance history? What's the current reliability meantime between failures? What's the spares lead time? If it's everything's in, in place and I can fix it quickly, then the risk makes it less critical. Asset replacement value planned utilization, these all matter. And it's so it's not just about the perceived risks of the organization. It's what are you doing to manage that and to bring this asset into a non-critical? Simple thing in an exercise I would do would be where people are, are, are looking at the reliability of an asset and trying to determine what could they do to make it of a less critical impact for when it fails, okay? Manage out, engineer out the, 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 the risk, okay? I'm going to quickly stop. Maybe we just do one poll. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm going to ask um, Erwin and Patty to run 
just one poll question, please, because I'm a little bit behind. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Oops. Go away. Stop share. Okay. Over to you, Owen. Thank you, Tom. So um, our poll question is, how does your organization currently make decisions on whether to repair or replace? So please uh, choose your answer. Uh, we'll give it about uh, one minute. Okay, thank you. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds to go. Please choose your answers, your responses. Okay, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Thank you for your responses. Let me share the results to you, Tom. Okay. Okay. Very good. So we've got some a good mix, and that, that's not untypical um, from uh, what I would see. Um, can everybody else see this? The same results, yes. Owen? Yeah. Yes, everybody uh, can see it. Let me. That's Sorry, that's not untypical from what I would have expected. Uh, I'm pleased to see that whole life costs have already been established and updated in some organizations. Um, I know a lot of organizations are now working on that. There are some organizations already working towards 55,001. Um, so it's, it's great. It, it, it warms my heart to see that um, the organizations are moving forward from uh, where they used to be. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll just... Go straight back into my presentation, if that's okay. Okay, um, thank you, Tom. Right, let me just share my screen again. Uh, I've lost my bar. There we go. Okay, can everybody see my screen again? Yes, I can yeah. see okay, it. Okay, thank you. Okay, we were at the uh, the midpoint. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm running a little bit behind. I will continue. If you wish to stay with me, please feel free to do so. If you want to drop out because you've got other commitments, I understand, okay? My apologies that it's taken a little longer. We have run this one before in an hour. Maybe my short notes are actually longer. All right. What I'm looking at here is, does an organization need a maintenance strategy or an asset strategy? And there's been a lot of confusion in the industry as to, I have an asset management strategy and they put in front of me a maintenance strategy. Okay. So, and the answer really is it's, it's kind of both, but one falls inside the other. And I'll share that in a moment. And let me clear off at first, what do I mean by maintenance strategies? To me, as a maintenance guy, a maintenance strategy is whether I let it run to fail, I do preventative, predictive, predictive, Sorry, uh, pre preventive, predictive, condition monitoring, whether I move into RCM, uh, whether I use go into um, a whole host of other maintenance strategies. And they're, they're the four main ones that's there. And they form part of a maintenance plan to me. So the maintenance strategies are the tools and techniques I use, and I put them into a plan, and, and I'll use different strategies depending upon the asset. Um, and then I will put that plan into an asset management plan, okay? So the maintenance plan, which includes the maintenance strategies, now becomes part of your asset management plan, which includes the finance, the operations plan, the maintenance plan, everything in there rolls up to being an asset management plan. And it's updated on a regular basis as the condition of the asset and the age of the asset deteriorates, okay? Um, so an asset management plan, an AMP, okay? What do I mean by an AMP? Um, it's really about, as I said, what are you going to do to that asset? How are you going to fund that asset for the time period you expect that asset to operate? It will include its uh, production targets, okay? 
It will include your service obligations as well as the practical stuff that goes with that. You've got to be able to understand what is expected of the asset and what are you doing, uh, what is needed to achieve those objectives. The strategic asset management plan, that's really about looking at the, the, the higher holistic view, the longer term view, and it might even be looking at, I've got this asset which has an asset management plan, it's part of a production line, and my plan for the production line um, is broader and longer than it may be for that particular asset at this time. You may be working more in the, the short term on the particular asset. The asset management system plan. Having designed an asset management system, and I'm not talking about software here, I'm talking about the people, the, the policies, the process, and the tools that come in to manage your assets. If you have that in place already, you have to have a plan for how you're going to develop it and maintain it. Okay. So you'll hear these phrases, your maintenance plan, your maintenance strategies form, for, form part of your asset management plan. But most importantly, your asset management strategy has to be part of your organization's wider business strategies and plans. It's got to be owned by your top level management, preferably approved by your board. Okay. So let me try and, and show where this comes in. Okay. So your maintenance strategy through your maintenance plans forms part of your asset management plan. So we started off down here, your maintenance plans where, where many people actually focus. They go into the asset management plan, you're bringing in your financials, you're bringing in your, uh, your service obligations in there as well. Um, and th that then forms part of your strategic asset management plan, your overall asset management objectives. What are you trying to achieve? This should be, your, your asset management uh, plan is part of your orga or the organizational strategy, and it must be dovetailed with the other organizational policies. If it's standalone, then you're going to run into difficulties when you try to fund it accordingly. Okay. And of course, you've got your asset management system plan that manages the, the actual system that you've got. That's probably the easiest way that I can show it, and it is from ISO 55001. 2014 edition. Um, an asset management plan is a plan that developed for the management of one or more assets. Okay, and again, some organizations will do it per asset. Um, some will do it for clusters of assets where they're, they're doing a similar duty and they're a similar age, and it's easier to do it that way rather than try and do it one for everything. So they have a template and they plot against where each asset is against the template. Okay, um, five steps complete the asset inventory calculate the whole life cost um you may if it's a legacy asset you may not be able to go back but you can at least predict what it's going to cost from where you are now if you understand the condition you can predict where you're going to go and what you will spend on it it's very difficult to go back if the history isn't there set service levels apply cost effective management and then of course ensure its financial planning what does a mass asset management plan look like? This is one. I personally think there are too many pages. I will try and get it down to a more usable document of two or three pages if I can. Okay. The more pages, the less likely it is to be read. It's, it's a hard fact. Okay. Keep it simple. Keep it stupid. Um, I do like this one. Everybody has um, a... Uh, what's happened here? Uh, one second. Yeah, sorry. Um, everybody has a plan until they're punched in the face. I and Mike Tyson. A plan is only as good as the frequency at which is updated and the, uh, as, as good as how the risks it's currently facing are understood. Nothing stays the same, okay? Your risks will, will evolve. Your equipment will age your plan needs to be updated. New realities will affect it. Your production might increase. Therefore, you're going to have to revisit your plan. Okay. So how do you do this? How do you maintain a plan? Proactive review. Don't wait until something happens. If nothing's happened after maybe one or two years, dust the plan off. Let's have a look at it. Is it still relevant? Um, are we doing things that we, should, we don't need to do because there's been no issues? Engage with the stakeholders, internal and external if there are people like regulators that you need to talk to as well. Update the plans, 
they're not a single time right document. Document what you did, why you did it. If you change something, what was the assumptions you used? Document everything. So that if in the future that somebody questions that decision, people understood why that decision was made. Okay. Definition. Um, we, we talked about the whole asset life. Okay. Um, this is the holy grail. Everybody wants to know, um, especially your finance people, how long will it last? Okay. And you will get quoted to you this chart or something similar. Okay. That says, look, the textbooks tell me, you can tell me when I need to replace the asset. Okay. And there's a cost of here that they'll show a cost of replacing the asset that goes down as it gets older. The um, cost of running the asset goes up as it gets older. And then you've got this optimum. When you put the two lines together, you come with this optimum. And somewhere around here, we should be thinking about replacing the asset, preferably before the costs start to rise. In an ideal world, that would be lovely. Um, but in reality, you probably don't have enough data points to plot this chart in the first place. And when you plot it, in many industries, the cost of the asset is so high that you never actually get this intersection point. It never becomes a, affordable to replace it until it's absolutely can't run anymore. Okay. Um, and it can be a little bit hard to predict. Um, I do a whole exercise on this uh, if we were running the full course. Um, so what can you do? If it's a new asset, Desktop exercise using all of the available data. You haven't got any history. It's a new asset. Determine the cost of ownership. So you're looking at what information is out there. Um, how much does it cost to buy? How much does it cost to install? You're going to start looking at what, you, what maintenance interventions are recommended by the manufacturer. Using your own experience of maybe operating similar equipment, you might want to start bringing in some, some variables there. Align it with the business objectives and the service levels, and then you establish an, an optimal economic life, okay? Now, it's desktop. What I would say is when you bring in, use all available data, talk to the manufacturers, talk to other organizations if, you're, if you have those kind of relationships that may be operating similar assets uh, that, that you are about to buy. Do look for industry studies, look for academic papers, there's a lot of data out there if you are looking hard enough and you join the right societies. I do, I do recommend that you, 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 you look at that carefully. Um, desk, for existing assets, you can still do the desktop and you can validate using all available uh, on site using the available data. Again, when I've looked at desktop studies and I've gone out to facility for existing assets, quite often there are assets there that aren't even being talked about or what we were looking at from the records is not what's in, in that location anymore. So it, it happens. Um, determine the asset age and its history if you can. Determine the current asset condition. Very hard to go back and look at the whole life cost if the records aren't there about how much it costs to buy, how much it costs to install, you don't have any production operations data or, you, or you're not enough or you don't have any maintenance data. You can't reinvent history. But what you can look at, what will it cost me going forward? And that starts off very clearly by understanding your asset condition. Determine the current performance. Understand what it's costing you to operate it now. Align it with the business objectives. Align it with the required service levels and establish an optimal, optimal economic life. But I would expect as you go through this, that rather than just living with what you've got, you would optimize it as you went forward as well. Where do you get the information? Manufacturers data, industry studies, taxation tables. A lot of the IRS, the Bureau of, uh, uh, what, what is it here? The uh, uh, Internal Revenue Organization. Um, they will have tables that will tell you typically how companies are allowed to write off their assets, okay, without from a taxation perspective. They're useful. They're not necessarily accurate, but at least it gives you a basis and it should be something you take into consideration. They're usually based on some studies. Condition assessment, what's, look at your O&M philosophy and, your, your, and how it's been executed. Look at your asset history. Look at your operating environment and look at your service levels. Current and future, the C and the F. It's not just what it's doing today, but what are you going to be expecting of this? Will, it, will production ramp up? Will production ramp down? And you should be amending your 
your asset management plans and your, op your optimal life um, uh, forecast based on that. And again, it's not a one-time deal. You, you, you establish a life, but you need to review it on a regular basis. Okay. Typical tables. Um, these are from industries that I'm more familiar with and they may not mean much to you, but typically um, a manufacturer will say instrumentation, PLCs, five to seven years, for example. The IRS of the US talks about six years and that's comparable with what the, the UK says as well. Um, the regulator here in the Philippines said they had to last for 10 years. Our internal finance table was 10 years because the regulator said 10 years. Okay, research papers say seven is unreal is realistic. We were able to show from history we will operate them for more than 10 years, though there was big questions on the efficiency and reliability in doing that strategy. We were able to actually remodel this back to a seven-year replacement cycle. Okay. And again, I put motors, gearbox, diesel engines. These are typical. Um, you need to choose for your industry though, because clearly. Uh, an industry working in a very toxic environment, assets will not last as long as those in a brand new clean electronics factory where the air condition, temperature, humidity is, is managed perfectly. Okay. If it's outside and it's going from minus 20 to, to plus 40 over the course of the year, then, then clearly it's going to have a different impact on it. So these are tables, the guidance, you have to apply local conditions. Okay. Um, I just want to talk briefly about condition assessment because it, it's something, again, that I, I find many organizations, they do it when they need to, um, but they don't really have a good handle on the condition of an asset at any moment in time. And I would always recommend that if you're going to do some uh, benchmark your data, maybe a one-time condition assessment, and then you maintain the data accurately going forward. Uh, and you update the condition assessment every time you do an intervention, be it plan preventative maintenance, uh, condition monitoring, or whether you've had to go in and do a repair. But many organizations focus heavily on point data. And a lot of them don't have a lot of good point data either. Okay. Uh, I hope the people I'm talking to have got excellent point data. Um, but when, they, when I look at what they've got, and they tell me the asset condition, it's all focused around here. Okay, they talk to me about vibration levels, they'll talk to me about maintenance interventions and histories and things like that. So I've got data. But then I had to ask a question about, well, what about the structure it's on? Um, is the foundation bolts good, et cetera, et cetera? Is the um, building, uh, is, is the plinth it's on got any defects and cracks? Um, is there any warping in the, the frame that it sits on? I, I get a few blank stares and that data isn't there for them. It may be noted, it may be acted upon, but the data isn't there. It's not been recorded or it's not been assessed. The environmental condition, I go back to, assets operate in different environments. Um, is it working in a very hostile environment? For example, um, you're working with, with a corrosive, where, where there is a, an underlying corrosive nature. Assets working around uh, um, in wastewater treatment plants, for example, hydrogen sulfide. You've got assets work which creates hy hydrochloric acid, of course. Yeah. Or you've got assets uh, working in a water treatment facility with chlorine gas. And inevitably, there's always a chlorine uh, ability to uh, cause corrosion. You could be working with assets in the uh, open environment, subject to wind, rain. We've got some serious uh, uh, challenges with climatic events here in the Philippines. So understanding the environmental conditions and how does that affect the condition. The visible defects, they're normally picked up, but they for, usually form part of the asset history. But when I talk to as, uh, asset managers, I talk to operators, they're not particularly well recorded. And people get blind, defect blind. They walk past the same defect every day because it's always been there, no, nothing's been done about it. They reported it six years ago, nobody did anything, so they just walked past it every day. In a UK setting, I used to remember um, walking into a facility and everything was running on manual. And when I asked why it wasn't running an automatic, well, it, it always sends out alarms. And the alarms are annoying, so we put in manual and ignore the alarms. Um, so you get a little, your operators can get a little blind to what's really happening there. And then the aesthetic condition. 
seems simple, but to the people who's operating it, look after it. Is it oily, dirty, grimy? Um, is there oil weeping from the, uh, the, the various glands or the, the, the um, plugs? If it's not being looked after, it tells you a lot about what the condition of the asset could be because an operator who doesn't love their asset, generally, it will not perform as well for as long. Um, we're getting close to the end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, and I would like you to look at this. This is my favorite model. There's a lot of different models out there. If you want to, um, I, I can't give credit to the owner for this one. It's not me. I will share that with you right now. Um, but it's been around and in my, um, uh, how I work for so long that whoever said it first, and I think it was um, a consultant in the United Kingdom, but whoever gave me this has long since disappeared. Um, and I, so I can't credit them. When you look at an organization, I like to break it down into five. And, and there are many models that also do it in five. Reactive, organized, managed, optimized, and intelligent. I have never managed to get an organization fully into four. And the reason that is many will pitch themselves at level three and four immediately. But when you scratch the surface, when you really start to understand what you're doing, what you're doing well, and if you ask yourselves the questions honestly, most organizations start off between two and three. I'm really pleased I've not worked with anybody that's in level one. Okay. Um, and that's both in the UK and here in the Philippines. And I sense that quite often I see people that's got some in level two, the majority in level three, and some level four, but you then have to still default. They'll try and say they're level four, but the reality is you're still level three. And you've got some good things you're doing, but there's some things that you need to address as well. And what we're looking at here is when you're looking at your organization, you're trying to improve your asset management uh, life cycle, you've got to ask yourself these questions. Are you in crisis avoidance? Are you working within departments? Are your systems standalone? Does your maintenance management system already talk to the finance system? Does it talk to the project planning system? Yeah. Um, if not electronically, are the interconnections there so that the manual activity is being, is being, at least connections are there? Specialists are tend to be brought in to deliver change. You bring a consultant in because you don't have the in-house capability to do your own changes. Um, basic asset data is available. There's some analysis, but not thorough. It, it still tends to be maintenance driven. And there's a lot of organizations have some of those still happening. The majority of organizations I work with are in the managed and are trying to bring all into the managed or trying to move somewhere to a level optimized. Okay, here you're looking at things that are across departments. You've got systemized decision making, processes are automated. That's a big gap. Uh, many, many processes here uh, I tend to find are still uh, standalone. Um, certainly, the organizations I've worked with here, they tend to be finance have got their processes and nobody will play with them whatsoever. And then you've got asset management have got their processes and they must be complied with. And then maintenance have got theirs. So Again, something we'd look at how, how integrated are the process and, and have you automated some of the steps? The AMS software is implemented and being used. Most organizations are already here, but I wouldn't say it's been optimized. They're using risk-based management. They are doing life cycle costing. And what was interesting was some of your organizations that when, when we look a little bit back, I can see people who are three going four, maybe some even in four, okay? Um, some are two moving towards three based on that question I asked you a little earlier. I'm going to ask you a poll at the end if you're still with me. Um, having a look at this, this chart here, um, where do you think you are? Just so have, I'll just give you a, a minute to look at because I'll ask you a poll at the end and, and say, where do you, having listened to everything I've said so far, where do you think you are based on the model that I like? And there are other models out there that you could choose if you wished. All right, I'll give another. 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. Um, one thing I, I always recommend, though, is that I, I see when I work with companies here in the Philippines, there's a lot of actions and a lot of activity. There's a lot of good stuff happening in your, your, your organizations in really setting up good, robust asset management systems. 
One of the things I, I tend to see less of, though, is a cohesive plan. OK. Um, I know where which company this came from. OK. It was a water utility in the United Kingdom. They didn't create it. It was actually brought in by a consultant because if I go back, we were here. Yeah. We were doing a lot of work. We had some activity going on here, but we couldn't really move ourselves forward because it had never been done before. Not, not for the, the people that we had in our organization. So we brought a consultant in to help us and they drew this map. I don't like it. It's very hard to follow. There's better roadmaps out there. But what I like about this map is this, okay? First off, it required that the board bought into it because this is a lot of work. People are going to be, have, um, will have to let other targets slide to achieve some of these because, or the increased resources to allow it to happen. OK, so it's going to require investment of time and money. So the board needs to be on board. Uh, sorry, sorry for the pun. OK, then, of course, you start looking at the various departments that come into play. And as you can see, this is a cross, cross business activity. It's not a maintenance or operations or even an asset management department activity. It requires nearly every part of the organization to come to the table and help and do their bit to make an asset management system work, okay? So not an easy roadmap to follow, and I'm not gonna go through the various blocks and the interconnection points. That's not appropriate here, and it would take too long anyway. But what I wanted to show was when you build your roadmap, it's not a department's responsibility. Um, my old CEO used to say, Tom, it takes a village to build a house, and it takes an organization to build an asset management system. Okay, what happened there? Why did that happen? Oops, uh, go back, sorry. My last slide. Okay, when you're doing your change, when, when you're doing your uh, asset management improvement activities, there's a lot going on. You will find people are excited, a lot of enthusiasm. Then they realize the amount of work that's coming. Then they get bogged down by the work and eventually they stop and they move on to other things and it could fail. Change management. If you're bringing this in, it's a cross court organization, like I showed the last slide. It is really about bringing in um, the whole organization, but doing it with a proper change management uh, control. Okay. Um, don't treat it as separate activities. Try and treat it as a project and put a change management function in there as well. That would be my guidance. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think we have one more poll for you. And then I'll open for questions. Uh, I'll stop sharing. So can you put the poll out, please? Yeah. So the poll question is, if you were to describe your organization's approach to asset management, would it be a reactive, emerging, managed, optimized, intelligent? Okay, we'll give a minute to answer this. Yeah. Okay. I are we okay, ten minutes, ten seconds? Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, sharing okay. the results now. That's that's very interesting. Um, again, not untypical. Um, I would be surprised if some of your organizations weren't doing one or two things already and optimized. Um, I haven't worked with an organization either here or in the UK that has much headway into intelligent because the technologies of AI and machine learning, they're still relatively expensive, new to a certain degree, even though machine learning has been around a while now. But it, it tends to require a lot of data that many organizations don't have. So intelligent, I think, is you're cutting edge and there will be organizations out there in that arena, but managed teams to be where many of organizations find that the costs are, um, the, 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 what they spend delivers what they want. 
Okay. Optimized is definitely worth aiming for, but again, maybe not everything because costs can increase again and not everybody can afford it. Okay. Right. Then um, let me just uh, go back to the last question. Does anybody have any questions? Right, Tom, there is a question uh, from okay. the chat. Okay. Um, let me share the screen. So the question is, uh, what data and tools do we need to build a complete bathtub curve? Okay. Well, the first, the first thing I would say was um, for a full bathtub curve, um, you would need to have, and you're doing it from an asset management perspective, you need to have a lot of assets doing the same activity um, for that to happen. The bathtub curve traditionally is used when you're creating, for, for example, if, if, if I was to pick a simple one, uh, a, a mobile phone, a brand new to market mobile phone, we're talking iPhone 1. Yeah. When that came out, there was a lot of problems in the first generation. By the time they got to the second and third generation of software, their failures had started to drop into a nice stable basis. And then as the mobile phone gets later, uh, older and the battery starts to fail and the, the, the software hasn't been updated in a while, it gets clunky and starts to fail again. So you're looking at where you've got ma massive volumes of data um, to build a, a bathtub curve. And you're only really looking at a bathtub curve if you have a product or a asset and if you're if you're looking at assets, you have a number of assets that fail early in their infants rate. OK, now, if you're buy, buying assets that fail early in the infants rate, I would question from an asset management. It's not a curve I would want to see. I don't want early infant mortality. OK, if I'm a product I'm producing a product, that might be an acceptable curve with a very steep drop in the infant mortality. You expect some teething troubles. So from an asset perspective, I would very much prefer to see the second curve where it showed that there's a nice stable, maybe slightly increasing, it might be flat, um, curve being built across and you're looking at failures. For that data, what data would you use? You're plotting the failures um, or the interventions you've made, non-planned activity. So you separate out your planned activity because if you've done a planned intervention, you've taken it offline to do a particular clean or you've, you've introduced some new parts because um, you, you want to replace before the wear out. Planned interventions don't normally appear in this type of data. You're looking at failure rates, okay? So for a bathtub curve, it's high volume of data, lots of, lots of products or assets, and you're, predict, you're plotting their failure. Now, you need to have some granular information as to what those failures were because you've got to then start digging down into what are the failures associated with software? What are the failures associated with hardware? What was the failures associated with installation? That type of thing. Okay. Um, does that answer your question on the bathtub curve? Yes, it's a useful curve. It's not one I've seen often referred to because um, many organizations don't have that high volume of the same type of asset. And it has to be the same type of asset. You can't put a pump in there and a gearbox and a, you, you've got to put like for like components or assets in. Okay. okay. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Um, for the next question is, if you're looking to buy a piece of equipment, who do you determine its life cycle cost to make an informed decision? Number one is, yes, you should be looking at the full life cycle cost um, when you're making a decision. Again, I've worked in organizations where we've had, because the assets we're building, are possibly brand new facilities. We've had consultants come in and do that type of activity for us because we didn't have the in-house resources. But when we're doing a piece of replacement, we would actually do a whole life cost analysis. Um, and it was often driven by the operations and maintenance team. We would work with the asset management team, which was emerging at that time. Um, and that would become part of its asset management plan once we've done that piece of activity. But because the operator and the maintainer have usually got a, a, a very strong interest in getting the right piece of equipment, they want to understand which is the one that's going to provide them with the least liability issues and the least cost of, of ownership. Um, so that I would say, yes, it's got to be done when you're doing a new piece of equipment. Again, you might want to put a, a limiter on it. You might want to focus initially on your, your most critical assets. And then you want to, once you've got that set up, you critical, you might want to roll it out for everything. 
yes, I would argue every time you're buying a new piece of equipment, um, I would do a whole life cost because you want to buy the right one. You don't want to be, make a mistake that buys the, the most expensive one. And then you find out the servicing is very intrusive. For example, if I liken it to a car, okay, keep it simple, something we all know. If you buy a BMW, yes, it might give you a longer lifespan than a, uh, a Toyota uh, of, a, of a similar size. However, when you take into account the cost of servicing, the importing of parts, the frequency of servicing, because you move, you, you're driving a European car in a tropical country, when you start factoring in all of those other things, the cost of owning the BMW looks pretty horrendous versus the cost of looking at uh, the, the Toyota, which may give you a little bit more problems later down the line, but the cost of those problems is less than the cost of actually keeping the BMW in top shape, okay? So I would argue every time you're doing a, 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 an asset replacement of a significant asset, yes, do a whole life cost analysis. But then the information you create from that becomes part of your updated asset management plan. Make sure that information is not lost. Record your assumptions that you use because you may not have all of the data available to you. You'll make decisions and assumptions that we've assumed that we're going to have to repair or replace a rotor every five years. We're going to have to do um, uh, um, a rebalancing of the shaft every 15 years. If you put those assumptions in, make sure the assumptions are appropriate to the asset and you're not biasing it one way or the other. Um, the value of an asset management team coming in is they tend to try and override operations. And I'm guilty because I'm ex-operations myself. Um, operations know that that piece of kit, it doesn't give them any headaches. They want that piece of kit and they only want that piece, and they will try and make sure the argument to support that piece of kit. So do make sure it's objective and having an outsider come in and make sure that the objective that is, is, uh, the objectivity is there is important as well. But yes, the answer is, uh, do do that. I would argue that the people that should be doing it are a combination of procurement, maintenance, operations. If you have an asset management department, they should be overseeing it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. I think that's the, all, all the questions that okay. we have. And now uh, we would like to say thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, I think before we close in, um, I, I have some information that I would like to share with you through Patty. Patty, would you like to share some um, upcoming? Uh, events. So if you like this asset life cycle, I think Patty has also provided some reference in the chat. Um, in our upcoming uh, training, a full training on this is on November 10 to 12 on asset life cycle and life cycle cost management. Um, for the questions about uh, sharing the materials, um, we were glad that we were given approval by Tom to share his materials with you. So thank you very much, Tom, on that. Uh, we will send that over to your emails, the ones that you have used to register. So um, it's been, uh, we, we took an overtime. So we still are thankful that you stayed up, stayed with us. So I will not uh, keep you any longer, but I would like to request to give Tom a big round of applause for sharing his knowledge and time with us on this asset life cycle and life cycle cost management. Thank you very much, Tom. And, and my, my pleasure. God yeah, bless thank you. you. Thank you very much. And to all, uh, yeah. please have a great and, and safe um, day. Uh, to those who are joining us from other uh, time zones, thank you. And God bless everyone. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.